Watch out for this happening just before the Antichrist shows up. Each of us, when we start our lives, gets the chance to make choices, and these choices have really big results that last forever. None of us will be gone in 100 years, a thousand years, or even a million years from now. The choices we make have a forever impact, leading to consequences. Our world often tries to make things look better than they are, blurring the lines and hiding the truth that choices have serious results. Even though the mark of the beast isn't happening right now, you and I still have a really important choice to make. It comes down to choosing between Jesus Christ or the Antichrist in some way. There's no middle ground. The times when the world turned away from Christ were the times it might have, without realizing, accepted the Antichrist and the things that come with his rule. The day the world chose the mark of the beast wasn't a sudden fall into darkness. Instead, it was the result of many choices that turned away from the light of the world. If we say no to Jesus Christ, it often leads us to say yes to the Antichrist. Staying neutral on things that matter forever is not really an option. When Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me, he made it clear that there's no in between, especially when it comes to the end times. If we say no to the truth, we're left with only one option, accepting lies. There's simply no middle ground. When we ignore the truth, deception is all that's left. Ephesians 6, 12 talks about how our struggle is not just against other people, but against powerful forces in the spiritual realm. Paul, the apostle, used different terms to describe these spiritual enemies. The Bible teaches us an important lesson. There's more going on than what we can see. Unfortunately, some Christians avoid talking about the spirit realm thinking it's too extreme. But the Bible clearly says there's a spiritual realm we can't see, with good entities like God and angels, and bad ones like the devil, and demons like the devil, and demons these demonic forces are active in our world. In Revelation, there's talk about the mark of the beast, 666. This mark is like a stamp for the followers of the Antichrist and the false prophet. While many know about this mark, its meaning, and why Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet want people to accept it, aren't well. No. The answer, mentioned multiple times in Revelation, is simple. Worship. In my sermon today, look for this to occur just before the Antichrist arrives. I highlight a crucial sign to identify the Antichrist, to spot the Antichrist. Look for a person who convinces the world to worship him, someone who demands to be treated like a god. This call for global adoration and self-deification will be a key feature of the Antichrist's coming. Imagine if the fuss about the mark of the beast has already started, but most people don't realize it. This issue goes way back to before we even existed, starting with the fall of Lucifer. Understanding this background is crucial for grasping the ongoing spiritual struggle. The fall, described in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, provides key insights. Isaiah witnessed the downfall and its aftermath. In this account, the highest of God's angels, often identified as Lucifer, tried to take God's throne, aiming to redirect worship meant only for God. This angel displayed extreme pride and ambition, challenging the very essence of God's sovereignty and holiness. This rebellion marked the first sin in history, sparking a heavenly war. This sin caused Jesus Christ to witness Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It disrupted the perfect harmony of the celestial realm and introduced rebellion into a once flawless creation. This sin brought forth the concept of evil, previously unknown in God's perfect creation. 
setting the stage for the ongoing spiritual battle between good and evil. It serves as a cautionary example of the consequences of pride and rebellion against God. This particular sin, a wicked desire for worship, is what will one day lead the world to accept the mark of the beast. This episode is known as the Five I Wills of Satan, revealing Satan's sinful disposition, including rebellion, disobedience, self-sufficiency, pride, self-exaltation, and most importantly, his intense desire for worship. Satan's statements not only involved rejecting God's rule, but also aiming to replace it with his own. His desire wasn't just for equality with God, but for superiority, representing the essence of sin. Satan wanted what wasn't rightfully his, and even now, he continues to crave what doesn't belong to him. Worship. Let me share these five statements with you. I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. These statements reveal the core of Lucifer's nature, emphasizing his fundamental desire for worship. In heaven, God Almighty is universally adored and worshipped. This adoration is fitting because worship rightly belongs only to Him. If we could catch even a glimpse of heaven, we would see countless angels stretching as far as the eye can see, all exulting and worshipping the Lord God Almighty. In heaven, every being worships God the Father and the exclusive path to the Father and the exclusive path to the Father is through Jesus. In heaven, the name of Jesus is lifted higher than any other name, surpassing kings, queens, emperors, and empresses. Every being in heaven worships him. Satan, on the other hand, desired something that didn't rightfully belong to him. Let me digress for a moment to talk about God, his character and attributes. Have you ever noticed that the five I wills of Satan were not spoken aloud, but were the condition of his heart? While Lucifer might have continued with his duties, appearing to be a loyal servant in his heart, he desired exaltation and worship. God knew the true condition of this seemingly perfect angel. As I share this sermon, it's essential to understand that God knows your heart. He's not interested in religious catchphrases or mumbo, jumbo. God cares about the sincerity of your heart. 1 Samuel 16 emphasizes this, stating, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. As I preach, there might be people feeling anger towards God due to events in your life. Even if you don't openly express it, that anger may be hidden deep within your heart. It's something you might not admit, but God knows. You might never express it openly, but this hidden anger towards God lingers silently in your heart and soul, quietly fueling your discontent. Despite still attending church and proclaiming Christ with your mouth, there's a hidden anger towards God deep within. However, it's crucial to remember that God is most interested in this inner world, the heart. As the scripture says, while man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. Satan never spoke the five. I wills aloud, but God saw them in his heart. You might deceive others, even your closest friends and family or your pastor, but you can't deceive God. He looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. And in Satan's heart, the desire was for worship and adoration. Shifting focus to the temptations, the devil presented Jesus with three distinct challenges. In the first one, 
He urged Jesus to turn stones into bread, saying, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Jesus responded, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The second temptation involved Satan encouraging Jesus to jump from the pinnacle of the temple, expecting angels to rescue him. Satan quoted scripture, saying, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus countered, saying, Again, is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, let's turn our attention to the third temptation, as recorded in Matthew 4, 8, 11. The devil took Jesus to an exceedingly high mountain, showing him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus responded, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. In this third temptation, the devil's goal was to have Jesus kneel and worship him. Satan offered the kingdoms of the world, claiming the power to bestow them, which is why the Bible refers to him as the God of this world. However, something mattered to him even more than worldly dominions. Worship, this insight into Satan's heart, reveals that worship and recognition are more valuable to him than possessing earthly kingdoms and their splendor. In the coming times, one of Satan's persuasive tools will be the performance of deceptive miracles, all designed to secure the worship of people worldwide. Satan's long-standing desire for worship will, for a brief time, be realized. The central issue of the Mark of the Beast revolves around worship. Today, God calls for a commitment and a decision on whom to worship. He urges his people to stand firm, not compromising the word of God, to pursue righteousness and holiness, and to reject all unrighteousness and iniquity. In the face of worldly challenges or persecution, victory is assured through Jesus Christ. God has elevated the name of Jesus Christ, and in Him we find no defeat but only victory. Therefore, as the end time church, we must not waver in our faith. I implore the church of Jesus Christ to take a stand, echoing Joshua's declaration. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We must commit to praising and worshiping the living God through Jesus Christ, the only pathway granted to us.